Hello and welcome. We're here at AFA's Airspace and Cyber Conference with Northrop Grumman's Tom Jones, Corporate Vice President and President of Aeronautic Systems. Thanks, Tom, for taking some time to chat with us today to talk about B-21 and other topics. Absolutely. Uh, very happy to be here with you. Our first question, which is there was a full panel this week on mm -hmm. the B-21 program. So what would you say are the things that really made the program a success over the last couple of years? Yeah, so, you know, there, there was a number of things that really um, have helped burn down the risk on this program and, and got a lot of the, the uh, positive feedback we've mm -hmm. gotten from the Air Force, Congress, OSD, et cetera. I, I think, you know, really, if you look at it, and I, I like to look at this in terms of what are lessons we can take and carry forward into other acquisitions as well, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, one thing I think, this is a program where we really tried to adapt digital technology, mm -hmm. digital engineering. So, so what does that mean? We've been doing digital models for years, right? right? When I was a beginning engineer 30 years ago, yes. I had CAD programs, right? <laughs> the difference was you couldn't connect, you couldn't interconnect uh, those tools so that one CAD model could feed another, right. could feed another, right? You didn't have the compute power, the software wasn't that advanced. We've now got to that stage. And what we've been trying to do is to, as we design and develop the B-21, develop digital models with very high fidelity mm -hmm. so that we can shorten the time to test because we're more accurate. We're also able to take this singular model of truth, if you will, of what the B-21 is and transfer it all the way down to operating instructions mm -hmm. on the shop floor sure. so that people on the shop floor can see the drawings right there. Yeah. A lot of benefits there. We've seen things such as we've been able to validate the structural models we used on B-21 to be twice as accurate as the typical results mm. that we get in industry prior to that. So we know that we've got very good models, drastically reduced the time that we need to do that. Right. So I think digital is, is a really key area. And maybe later on, I think we might talk about manufacturing a little bit. We are. And we'll talk about how, how does the digital um, model digital engineering interface with manufacturing and make that more effective another thing i'd say was really key in the success of the program is what we're doing is we say we make t1 like p1 okay so t1 is first test aircraft mm -hmm. p1 is first production aircraft mm -hmm. typically in a lot of aviation programs your first test article is what they call a flight sciences right it's stripped down no mission systems very rudimentary it's basically to get out there prove the aircraft flies as designed and you can expand the envelope if you do that and a lot of times it's made by a small group of highly experienced people maybe right. sometimes even engineers right you then have to turn around later on and figure out how you're going to produce that system mm -hmm. you have to design the tooling you have to figure out how to get shop floor instructions regular technicians can understand if you make T1 like P1, you're actually able to, at the same time you make that aircraft, flush out your manufacturing processes, your tools, your quality assurance, figure out your process drivers, mm -hmm. all as you move forward. You also end up with a test aircraft that's more representative sure. of the actual aircraft. Mm -hmm. So you can use it for more things than just exploring the flight envelope. So you have more assets and tests. So a lot of benefits to this. It takes a little bit longer to get it right, mm -hmm. but I think the payoff of parallelizing all those learning processes more than pays off for it. It enables us to go into production smoother and to get more product on ramp at a quicker rate and sooner, which is mm -hmm. what our customer wants. Final thing I'd throw in there is we've really tried to integrate sustainability mm -hmm. into our design right from the beginning. In the design aspects, we've also pulled in maintainers. They're helping us in our, our test cost centers right. work on the aircraft. We've pulled in software maintainers to help us work on the code in our software factory. Mm -hmm. So those, I think, were kind of the three big you know, program design. Of course, we've got a great customer, the RCO, kept the requirements stable, kept the funding stable, mm -hmm. and that has also been a key ingredient to success. Good stuff. Um, Great, some great, great insights there, Tom. So you mentioned earlier in your response about uh, best practices, lessons learned. Which of those might apply to other programs? So the B twenty one is a very specific program; it has its own lessons learned. But which of those translate to other programs? 
I think, I think almost all the things I mentioned do, right? I, I believe so. The, the challenge, you know, we have going forward is going to be how do we rapidly develop technology? How do we rapidly build and test it mm -hmm. and get that on ramp for our customer? Because the threat they're facing is, you know, this economic juggernaut that's just cranking war material mm -hmm. out at rate. So that's a challenge we as industry have. So the streamlining of designs, the ability to get improved efficiency in test and manufacturing that you get from digital engineering, I mm -hmm. think is, you know, that's a key enabler to how we're going to go forward and do that. I think the advanced manufacturing uh, techniques also are going to play a big part and I'm going to hold advanced manufacturing until later because that's like a, like a whole topic right. in and of itself. <laughs> um, I, I think another thing I didn't mention, but is getting quite a bit of use uh, that we're actually now spreading out across a lot of our programs at Northrop is the use of virtual environments and augmented reality. Mm. Okay. So we started on B21 with something we called the Hive, highly immersive yep. virtual environment. And it's the ability to take that digital model that we work with, a low fidelity physical mock up, and virtualized through augmented reality goggles right and be actually able to go and see how would i now maintain an aircraft do i need to move the position of something because i can't reach a hand back there right, right? tremendous success on b21 however we've taken that forward into other programs we're doing now and it's become an extremely popular design tool in fact we've created uh you know it, it used to be when you started you would go you know to the hive, it was a physical place. Right. We now have hives you can break up and set down in conference rooms so a group of engineers sitting around working on a digital model can pull the model up and interact in real space with it. They can look at maintainability. We have manufacturing engineers bringing in digital models of manufacturing tooling, digital models of uh, the actual pieces they're gonna be manufacturing, mm -hmm. and then seeing with virtual and augmented reality can they actually manipulate the tools the way they need to in the tooling? Right. So it can streamline all those things. So I think that's another thing it's already taking off within our engineering and manufacturing communities that we'll, uh, we'll continue to see more of. Um, so yeah, I think, and uh, as I mentioned on the whole T1 like P1, right. I think that's the way to do it. For sure. Yeah, so, that was an interesting comment about that. Um, and a good philosophy for other manufacturers going forward, I would imagine. Um, so let's stay on manufacturing a little bit. Okay. So how does Northrop Grumman differentiate itself in manufacturing? Because you're both a prime mm -hmm. and a supplier. Yep. I don't know if manufacturing is the same. You look at it the same for both a prime and a supplier, but tell us about that. So a lot of people don't know my background. I'm relatively new to the airplane industry. I spent a lot of time uh, in industry previously working unmanned underwater vehicles, submarine, advanced electronics, all those types of systems. Uh, when I came over to run the aeronautics sector, I very quickly discovered you can design the best LO aircraft, mm -hmm. but if you don't have a way of manufacturing that aircraft, um, a good design is not gonna get you there. It's gonna right. be very expensive. So manufacturing, particularly in stealth or low observable aircraft is really crucial. And it's an area that I think we're very good at Northrop and we invest a lot of money to make sure we stay good at that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let, let's take a fifth gen aircraft, which is a F-35. We're partners with Lockheed Martin on F-35. Mm -hmm. We have a production interval of 1.25 on F-35 program. That means every 30 hours, we send out another set of fuselage. Set of fuselage. Very complex piece of equipment. Mm -hmm the tolerances you have to hold all the different pieces and parts into right. itself is incredible, but yeah, to do it at rate, yeah. right? Yeah, it's the you, most complicated part of, a, of an aircraft, of a fighter plane. Exactly, right? So to keep those LO tolerances at that rate, very few com companies in the world can do that, right? right? Uh, and then I often refer to B-21 as the world's first sixth generation aircraft. The fighter guys get ticked off at me. They're like, <laughs> Tom, we don't number bombers, we don't, you know, okay. So I answered that in the panel today. Haven't heard from a fighter guy, they still might not like it, but you know, the way I put it is, if you look at what Secretary Kendall is saying about 
the need for family of systems and systems of systems approaches, we can no longer look at a combat solution for a mission as just being a fighter or just a bomber, mm -hmm. right? We need that added level of capability, the extra performance that platforms like B-21 and NGAD and CCA bring, that's part of the sixth generation answer. Right. And again, extremely high tolerances required to build these aircraft, you know, exotic materials. Again, we are the one company that is out there producing these aircraft, you mm -hmm. know, at this rate. So I, I think manufacturing is, is uh, something we're good at. Now, uh, that aside, what are some of the innovations that we're bringing to the field? Um, again, getting that digital model down to the shop floor is really key. We've introduced the use of augmented reality to help our technicians understand where to route things, where to inspect things, hydraulics, right. cables. A lot of the things that when you look at rework and repair on the shop floor, these are the high drivers. If you don't dress that cable exactly right, you're going to rework it, right. you can kink it right. If I now have a 3D augmented reality you know, vision of that, it's all saving time. And that all adds up to more margin in your schedule for other things, particularly when you're in development, right? Uh, so we're using augmented reality across the board. We're also investing in new manufacturing technologies, very interested in the use of full-scale determinant assembly. Um, you know, that's being used by a lot of aircraft makers. I think all the primes are, are out there mm -hmm. looking at that. How do we adopt something from the car industry? Again, we're all about stealth at Northrop Grumman. That's what a lot of our top selling platforms are about. How can we take something that puts together, you know, cars with tolerances of this, right? And use it on stealth aircraft with tolerances <laughs> of this, right? Uh, we're investing to figure out how we go and apply those types of things. And then also things like additive manufacturing. I think manufacturing is going to continue to be a key driver in the future because if you uh, look at that need to get product on ramp, a lot of times once you get past the original development, the long lead on everything is the manufacturing tooling, right? It's the, the, the brick and mortar to actually manufacture product in. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing all of that sequentially with your development, it pushes the timeline out. So again, if you can make T1 like P1, go to methodologies like full-scale determinant assembly and additive manufacturing, which minimize tooling, Right, you shorten that startup time. And that's something we learned, not those answers, but we learned in World War II, mm -hmm. the whole ramp up when the US started producing things, you know, right. the arsenal of democracy was once you got all the tooling in place and then we could get that's going. That's the key, yeah. Good stuff there, Tom. Uh, last question is about future trends like JATC2. So what are some of the processes and te techniques you're thinking about to, to move the company, company forward to develop new capabilities and technologies for the future? And many of them are needed now and even in the near future, they're not even a far future thing. So, so tell us how, right now we've been talking about what you're doing right now with manufacturing. Yep. What about that near future? Yeah, well, first, I think everything I've set up to now you just continue into the future. It's all part of the steady base. I think the next big thing we're looking at, and there's been a lot of talk, I'm sure you've wrote one or two articles about it already, is the whole unmanned autonomy, manned on man teaming, yep. right? I mean, that's that's where things are going. My my take, and again, I, I come from a background where I spent, you know, quite a number of years working unmanned undersea systems. Uh, there's a couple different levels here. I, I think there's a lot of what's catching everyone's imagination now is the artificial intelligence, machine learning, right. things like that. And that's great. And I think that has definitely got a place in what I would call the mission level of autonomy. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a place where a company like Northrop Grumman ought to look at going out and partnering with, you know, up and coming companies that have AI experts, mm -hmm. large language models and sure. areas that are pertinent to what we're doing. And that in fact is what we're out doing. There's another level of autonomy that's under that, that gets down to how do I actually certify an aircraft for airworthiness? It, it's not, you know, really compelling stuff when you think about autonomy, but being able to navigate an autonomous aircraft around a set of runways with crewed aircraft on it and do it safely, 
being able to tell the difference between a slight, you know, one degree slope on a runway vice a condition that requires a fast taxi abort right. and do that reliably. Hmm. Those are real critical things to proving you have aircraft that can fly that you can then layer that mission AI autonomy on. And that, frankly, is the heart of where Northrop Grumman is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's something we've been doing with Tritons, with Global Hawks, with Fire right. Scouts, with X-47B. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're 10 years since we did the first you know, launch and uh, recovery of the X-47B on the aircraft carrier. I remember. Fully autonomous, yes. right? I mean, so that, that I think is a capability we're going to continue to refine and something I think we, we bring to the, the unmanned, manned, unmanned teaming. Um, we're also spending a fair amount of time now looking at next generation mobility. So, you know, obviously right now everyone's looking at um, B-21, getting ready for first flight soon. Uh, we've got um, the various different services and their next gen fighters and the, the collaborative combat aircraft as that rolls out. The next wave, if we're gonna do this in the PACOM fight is really, how do we get the gas? How do we get the weapons? How do we get the food, the stores, the supplies over to that environment? And I think that's gonna drive new architectures. Mm -hmm. It's not just gonna be point to point. There's gonna be, you know, long range shuttles, maybe different hub and spoke models, you know, mm -hmm. so going and looking at actual logistics models and you know, what are the different types of systems that come out of that? I think uh, we just recently uh, were incorporated as part of the award announcement with Jet Zero and the blended wing body uh, next gen cargo slash tanker mm -hmm. uh, prototype. So very excited about working with Jet Zero on that. Uh, and then also we think there's a place for uh, high-speed vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, possibly hybrid, possibly electric, right? But I think mm -hmm. as you start figuring out how do you get supplies to an agile combat employment distributed right. uh, type of force structure, having smaller mm -hmm. aircraft that can get cargo there yeah. rapidly, I, I think is going to be a benefit. So we're really looking at all those. We have work going on in basic sciences, always material propulsion. But in terms of big trends where we see big Market mm -hmm. opportunities for aircraft is kind of in those areas right now. Good stuff there, Tom. Really appreciate your insights. And thank you for watching. Bye.